Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Israel says the body of one of the hostages taken captive by the terrorist group Hamas has been located beside a hospital. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says thanks to the spending by the Trudeau government, life is even more unaffordable for Canadians. And a Lethbridge campground received a major award Thursday in Las Vegas. We have the details. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Israel's military says it has found the body of another hostage in a building beside Gaza City's Shiva Hospital. The military identified the hostage as 19-year-old Corporal Noah Marciano. More than 240 people were taken hostage by Hamas during the terrorist group's deadly incursion into Israel on October the 7th. Israel accuses Hamas of sheltering in hospitals to use Palestinians as human shields. Palestinians and rights groups, meanwhile, say Israel has recklessly endangered civilians as it seeks to wipe out Hamas. The uncle of a three-year-old boy who was injured following a recent Israeli strike is now one of the boy's caregivers. He talks about how the war between Israel and Hamas has impacted his family. The boy's parents were killed in a recent attack. أحمد دمر نفسيته يعني على الآخر طفل نفسيته محطمة دائما خايف مش مستوعب اللي صار معه لا في المرة الأولى ولا في الثانية ولا في الثالثة فقد كل أسرته وما ظلتش على قد إنه فقد أبوه وأمه وأخوه الولد فقد ايضا دار سيد واهل ابوه جميعا ما بقيش له حدا الطفل حاليا عايش حياه ماساويه جدا 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 A Canadian woman who escaped the war in Gaza with her two sons says she's very thankful to be back home. The Mississauga, Ontario woman says she has worries however for the family she left behind. I'm uh, one of the evacuated uh, Canadians from Gaza Strip. I reached last week on Thursday. Um, me and my two kids, young kids, five and seven. Uh, I had to sleep because it was very like long, stressful journey. I slept for the two days after reaching, after one month of non-sleeping. Um, after that, I just get emotional uh, as I saw my kids and my house and my husband. Uh, I spend the, the rest of the, the weekend just like trying to um, like cuddling my kids, uh, be grateful for everything I have, the, the place, the, the husband, the, the, the kids, the, the cup of water, the cup of coffee. Uh, I hope everything will end soon. Uh, I don't wish anybody to go through what I've been through or what the Palestinians go through it. Meanwhile, the war in Ukraine continues. The Ukraine-Russian war is the main topic of discussion at a three-day global security conference taking place in Halifax. Foreign President Peter Van Prague says he chose to keep the focus of the event on the war in Ukraine and not the war in the Middle East. He says switching the theme would have played into the agenda of non-democratic nations. Still, the conflict in Gaza will be on top of mind and former Israeli government officials will be in attendance. An author and head of a Christian ministry says God is alive and well working in war-torn regions of both Gaza and Ukraine. Alistair Petrie is the executive director of Partnership Ministries and author of the book God's footprint on the land. He says his group is seeing God working in the hearts of Ukrainians and Russians alike. He says supernatural miracles are actually taking place. The biblical imperative is giving thanks in all circumstances. So Ukraine, Latvia, Belarus, Russia, with whom I'm doing a lot of work right now, they're realizing it's not about giving thanks to God just for the sake of the problem. That makes no sense. It's giving thanks that God is in charge over the problem if we understand what he's calling us to do. Now they're seeing breakthroughs. I mean, we're seeing miracles with some of the people that we work with, their neighbors, uh, the enemy coming to a knowledge of the Lord, both in the Russian and the Ukrainian sides. Uh, we're seeing uh, templates where God is releasing supernatural intervention, protecting people. 
Make sure you catch the full interview with Alistair Petrie from Partnership Ministries and BCM producer Michael Clausen coming up in the second half of our program. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says thanks to massive spending by the Trudeau government, the prices of goods keeps going up as do interest rates. Polyev says the consequences have been devastating for so many Canadian families. Trudeau has given us the worst inflation of any prime minister since his dad 40 years ago. And interest rates are now rising faster than at any time in Canadian monetary history. These are not just numbers. These are humans' lives that Justin Trudeau is screwing up. Two million people forced to go to a food bank in a single month. A record-smashing number. Because the average mortgage payment is up over 150%, people are losing their homes. And because more and more people are incapable of buying homes due to these high prices, they're all clamoring to compete for a diminished supply of apartments, driving the rent up to record levels. Last month, yet another record rent increase after Trudeau promised to bring rent down. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, meanwhile, spoke with reporters at the APEC summit, which wrapped up in San Francisco, California. Trudeau says it is vital for countries along the Pacific region to work together to help improve each other's economies. Canada is a Pacific economy, and we're working to strengthen and deepen our cooperation with the 20 other Pacific economies here at APEC. APEC represents almost 3 billion people and over 60% of global GDP. These are economies that are dynamic, growing, and that recognize that by working together, we can build prosperity that works for people across the Pacific from north to south. There's huge potential for Canada in opening up more trade along the Pacific. It's why we launched our Indo-Pacific strategy last year and why ministers from across the government have been working with counterparts in the region to strengthen Canada's presence and forge new opportunities. For the first time in four years, no public vigil was held in honour of a 26-year-old Calgary man who disappeared from Lethbridge. Today marks the four-year anniversary of Marshall Iwasa's disappearance. On November 17th of 2019, Iwasa left his mother's home in Lethbridge. He told her he had to go to his rented storage unit located on the city's north side to gather some computer equipment. He disappeared into the night and was never seen or heard from again. A week later, his truck was found torched in the backcountry near Pemberton, British Columbia. Now, for the past four years, this mysterious case was become widely publicized in specials on CBS, Paramount Plus and Discovery Plus, not to mention countless newscasts and podcasts. Marshall's mother, Tammy Johnson, says it's shocking that so many years later, there's still no clues to solving his case. It is just unbelievably disappointing and, and it really unbelievable, just purely unbelievable that we still don't have any more answers than what we had four years ago. Like, it's just uh, at a standstill. You know, we've got lots of people who um, are very interested in Marco's case, and, you know, it's it's hard to believe that nothing has, has come out of all the media and everything that, that we've, we've put out there. So what happened? We still haven't got a clue. Johnson says the family chose not to hold a public vigil this year because of the emotional toll it takes to organize. She did, however, create a personalized video for her son posted on Facebook. The Alberta Series Incident Response Team has concluded their investigation following allegations of assault by police of an adult female and her 12-year-old daughter. This is in connection with a domestic disturbance incident dating back to November 16th of 2019 involving Lethbridge Police. When police arrested the adult female, it was alleged that her daughter was injured with a cut to her chin along with the loss of a tooth. A few days later, it was alleged that the mother sustained broken ribs. Acer says after a thorough and independent investigation into the conduct of the officers, it was determined that they were lawfully placed and acted properly in the execution of their duties. They say while the use of force did result in some injuries, it was an unfortunate and unintended consequence. The report says the use of force was necessary and reasonable in all of the circumstances. A Fort McLeod town councillor who was charged during the Coots border blockade last year is speaking out in support of the Coots Four who've been in jail and not received bail for more than 18 months. Marco Van Hugenbos says it appears as though the four are being held as political prisoners. I believe that these men not getting bail, that bail is denied um, 
once and twice for some of these men is a political decision. There is political influence and political interference to make an example and to, I believe there's a, there's a, there's a bigger, there's a, there's a, I wouldn't call it a conspiracy, but there's a, there's a bigger picture at play here that ties back to the Emergencies Act, the implementation of the Emergencies Act. Van Hugenbos will also discuss his plight as he too faces charges for his involvement in the Coots border blockade. Catch the full interview coming up later in our show. David Lees is the host of the TV program Leaders of the Frontier, seen on Miracle Channel. Now, he spoke with Preston Manning about the findings of the recent Public Health Emergencies Governance Review, more specifically about the group's recommendations for the province should Alberta experience another pandemic. Manning says one of the recommendations is that it should be elected officials who are the ones making major decisions when it comes to dealing with a major pandemic. You very much uh, emphasize the role of elected officials uh, in an emergency and the approach that that needs to be taken. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I think you want to establish who's ultimately responsible for what's done or, or not done. And our view is that ultimately it's the elected officials. These are the only people that the public can uh -huh. hold accountable Indeed. in any way, shape, or form in, in a d democracy. So we make that clear in this section on leading the response, that at the end of the day, the, the political people should uh, approve the uh, or disapprove the orders and regulations that the uh, their officials put forward and be held accountable for what's done. Whenever you strengthen rights, you should say, what's the duty that goes Indeed, along with yes. the right? The, strengthen the right, but there's a duty to exercise it responsibly. Alberta's finance minister made a stop in Lethbridge today. Nate Horner says he's hearing from many in our agricultural community about the need for more water. Alberta had one of the dry summers on record this year. Horner says government officials are looking into more ways to help our producers with their irrigation issues since agriculture is such a big part of our economy. Working on our water security issues strategically, uh, especially considering the importance of this corridor, uh, is, is front of mind. It's absolutely huge. This is a you know, multi, a multi billion dollar industry, and you can't do much without water. We've seen, seen what happens without it. So, uh, we can't do, we can't do much to, uh, to change the, uh, you know, the state of the glaciers or how full, how full the rivers are, but we can, you know, work proactively towards, uh, you know, securing the water and being able to use it as efficiently as possible and manage the flows. The Alberta government says tourism has bounced back in a big way here in our province. Government officials say Alberta saw $10.7 billion in tourism spending last year. Now that's an increase of $600 million from 2019. The province launched a tourism recovery plan after the pandemic, which saw Travel Alberta's budget increase this year from $63 million to $72 million over three years. Officials say the added investments will help to support businesses, drive growth, create jobs, and sustain Alberta's visitor economy now and into the future. A Lethbridge campground received a nice prestigious award in Las Vegas. The KOA Journey Campground was honored with a KOA President's Award on Thursday during the Campgrounds of America's annual international convention in Nevada. The recognition is given to campgrounds that meet exceptional quality standards and who receive high customer service scores from their camping guests. Officials say, as a group, KOA surveys hundreds of thousands of campers annually regarding their KOA camping experience. It appears as though camping may be making a bit of a comeback as well. KOA says 53% of campers had already booked at least one camping trip for 2024, compared to just 13% of leisure travelers. Today was the launch of the 17th annual Christmas Hope campaign here in Lethbridge. Now six agencies stopped by City Hall to discuss how they're jointly serving our community to help provide for those most in need. For some, it starts with being able to help families put food on the table. From March 2022 to September of 2023, we've seen a rise of about 48% across food bank usage just in Lethbridge alone. Um, the big difficulty here is when food inflation goes up, the food banks get pinched multiple times. We have to buy more food for more clients. That food also costs more, um, and as such, we start eating through our budgets a lot faster than we see, um, just to meet the need that we normally had. We're not scared. We are 
cautiously optimistic because the community always comes through no matter what. So our target is zero to 18 years old. Um, we always struggle just a little bit with tweens. That's the 10 to 13 age group because they're difficult because they want to be teens and um, and it's expensive to um, fill their gift bundles and if you can believe it zero to 24 months old we are really struggling to fill our shelves with anything for that age group and there's quite a few um, angel tree alone has about 400 children that age group the various agencies say they're working together to help serve around 3,500 adults and 6,500 children here in southwestern Alberta. More information on how you can donate can be found on their website, christmashope.ca. Well, it looks like a beautiful weekend is shaping up weather-wise here in southwestern Alberta. Double-digit plus temperatures are on the way. A full look at the weather forecast is on deck. You know, it was a great day for taking your bike out for a ride along the coolies or maybe firing up the barbecue for a fabulous barbecue again tonight for dinner. Tonight, it should be mainly clear with a low near 2 degrees. Now, as we kick off the weekend, it should be mainly sunny tomorrow with a high near 13. Sunday, lots of sunshine as well with the mercury staying up at around 10 degrees. Monday, cooling off slightly to 4 degrees under a mainly clear sky. Now, the clouds will roll back in on Tuesday with the mercury dropping to minus 1. A mixture of sun and cloud and minus one as well for Wednesday. Thursday, mostly cloudy with the temperature steady around minus two. Now, the average high for this time of year is four degrees and an average low of minus eight. The record high was 18 degrees set way back in 1939. And the record low was a very cold minus 31 in 1955. The sun rose at 746 and set at 446. Let's see how Saturday is shaping up across the country now. It should be mainly rainy along the west coast. Victoria will see a high of 10 degrees and 11 degrees is on tap for Vancouver. Expect lots of sunshine and 9 degrees in Edmonton. Sunny as well and 13 degrees for Calgary tomorrow. A mainly clear sky and plus one is on tap for Regina. Quite a bit warmer at 9 degrees for Saskatoon. It'll be mostly sunny in Winnipeg with a high of 4 degrees tomorrow. Now in the central part of the country, you'll have lots of sunshine mixed with cloud and a high of 7 degrees in Toronto. Mainly overcast with a high of 2 degrees in Ottawa, sunshine and 2 as well expected in Montreal. Over in Atlantic Canada, expect rain and a high of 11 degrees in Fredericton, showers and 13 for Halifax, 14 and rain in Charlottetown, and in St. John's it should be mainly cloudy with a high near 11 degrees on Saturday. Researchers in the United States have created a 3D printed hand complete with replica bones, ligaments and tendons. They say the unique hand could advance robotic technologies, allowing for the creation of more complex and durable robots. There's a small amount of muscles down here in the palm area. Most of your muscles are actually in the forearm. So when you see this print that we made, we show you everything except for the skin that's, all, that's going over the hand. We show you sort of like the skeleton, we show you the fingertips, and we show you the tendons. The tendons are responsible for actuating your fingers. These are sort of like lines that go and run along the fingers and go all the way down to where the muscles sit. IBM says it has suspended all advertising on the social media platform X after a report by advocacy group Media Matters said its ads were placed next to anti-Semitic material on the platform formerly known as Twitter. Media Matters says ads for IBM, Apple, Oracle, and others appeared alongside material praising Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. IBM is investigating what it calls an entirely unacceptable situation. Billionaire owner Elon Musk sparked outcry this week with his post, his own post, responding to a user who accused Jews of hating white people, saying, quote, you have said the actual truth. Close to 250,000 Honda vehicles are being recalled across North America because bearings can fail, causing engines to stall, increasing the risk of a crash. Honda says connecting rod bearings in the engine can wear and seize due to a manufacturing error. The recall covers certain 2018 and 2019 Honda Pilot SUVs and Odyssey minivans, 2017 and 2019 Ridgeline pickups, along with certain 2015 to 2020 Acura TL cars, and 2016 to 2020 Acura MDX SUVs. Now, here's a look at today's markets. 
The TSX was up 122 points on the day to finish at 20,175. The Dow was up just under two points to 34,947. The S&P 500 was up five on the day to 4514, and the Nasdaq was up 11 points to 14,125. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 299 to 7589 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 10 cents to 296 US. Gold was down 8 cents on the day to 1980.82 US an ounce. Silver was down 3 cents to 23.72 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $9.06 per bushel, barley's at 6.98, canola's at 15.87, and corn is at 8.38 per bushel. Live cattle December contract was up a dollar to 175.75. Feeder cattle were down 74 cents to 228.64, and lean hogs December contract was down 50 cents to 70.98. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 72.87 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, six agencies which help our city's most vulnerable were at City Hall for the 17th annual Christmas Hope Campaign. The six, which includes our two local food banks, the Salvation Army, Lethbridge Family Services, My City Care Shop of Wonders, and Volunteer Lethbridge, say they're hoping to provide for 6,500 kids and 3,500 adults this year. That includes everything from food bundles to clothing and toys. More information on how you can donate can be found on their website, christmashope.ca. God is moving in many places around the world, including in some of the war zones in both Gaza and Ukraine. Now, that's according to Alistair Petrie with Partnership Ministries. He shares the details with BCM producer Michael Clausen in just a moment. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. And if you missed any of today's local stories, check out our website, bridgecitynews.ca. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. Come join the festivities at the second annual Christmas tree lighting event on Friday, November 17th, taking place in Festival Square at 5 p.m. Enjoy live music, pictures with Santa Claus, free cookie decorating, and feel the spirit of the holiday as the 18-foot Christmas tree is lit up for the season. Lethbridge Sport Council's Indoor Roving Gyms program is taking place Tuesdays at Emmanuel Lutheran Church from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. and Thursdays at the Service Sports Center from 10 to 11 a.m. This program is for kids ages 5 and under and their caregivers. Come and enjoy an hour of fun and get active. Pre-registration is required and space is limited. For details and to register, visit lethbridgesportcouncil.ca slash roving gyms. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. Current events happening around the world are proving to be quite unsettling for many people. Ongoing inflation, high interest rates, wars, terrorism, propaganda, political instability, the list goes on. What is God saying and doing through all of this turmoil that we're seeing? Well, joining us today from Vancouver Island is Dr. Alistair Petrie, Executive Director of Partnership Ministries and the author of God's Footprints on the Land. Welcome to Bridge City News, Dr. Petrie. Great to be with you again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you with us, I assure you. Um, can you first give us a brief overview of your ministry and, and tell us a little bit about this book as well. Well, it's actually, a, first of all, the ministry, Partnership Ministries, we developed in the latter part of the 90s. I'd been pastoring for many years in England, Scotland, Canada, and we'd seen some remarkable moves of God within specific templates. And we began to translate that contextually for uh, mission groups all around the world. We began being asked to travel to many places. And privilege-wise, we've been to over about 100 nations working with cities, leadership groups, business groups. It's been quite fascinating to see that evolve. So Partnership Ministries is very much a prayer-based ministry, but of research, asking God what's going on and translating that into tangible ways of application, applying specific principles, not in a, a silly way, but in a tangible way. We're arresting scripture, putting it into action, and then we're watching what we call transformational revival 
at extraordinary depths within cities, within nations. We went from about 200 cities in the late 90s to well over 2,000 in about 2003, so that we see templates of transformation. So we love authentic transformational revival. We love kingdom culture, but we're very much a research-based ministry for hands-on prayer. We call it on-site with insight. Well, the books that we've done, you're asking about that. So we've done a number of books over the years. Our, our initial book, Releasing Heaven on Earth, went around the world, followed by Transformed, In Holy Fear, God's Design in Challenging Times, which is all about understanding, you know, the, the parameters in which God uh, has his people operate. We did an In Holy Fear, which is still is probably our bestseller. What is the fear of the Lord in a time like this? That evolved into what we call the triplets of the Kingdom of Heaven series. Prophetic ditch digging, how do you really pray when you don't know what to pray for? God's footprint in business. And then finally, God's footprint on the land, which is um, a helpful way to see and understand how to apply principles through prayer and really see a, hand, a land being healed, uh, people being brought back, back into an understanding of God's purpose, design, and really putting practical prayer in such a way you see transformation at various levels of community, city, and even national life. Well, it's a unique way of looking at the spiritual and the physical or the relationship between the two. And of course, the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Could you maybe get into a couple of examples of where you were doing this research and you uncovered some things that were maybe strongholds in an area that you were able to then pray against? Well, actually, we've done that all across Canada, in Atlantic Canada, in Saskatchewan, in uh, Australia, in places like Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, where, in fact, you're seeing tangible breakthrough where people did not know what God was doing, couldn't see what was going on mm -hmm. because they were in an adversarial way, dealing with issues that 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 had blinded the minds of the unbelievers, but also the believers. They didn't right. see any sense of breakthrough. So our way was helping them to see what the obstacles were, why they were there, why the enemy has certain legal rights, and how to address those legal rights. So right now we're working with a lot of live streaming in some of the persecuted nations like Ukraine and Russia. So we're doing it not from the secular news perspective, which for me is often based on misinformation, disinformation, and the bias of the newscasters. We go behind the scenes, and we're seeing some amazing breakthroughs in these persecuted nations, like in the top 11 persecuted nations around the world, which obviously includes what we see happening in Korea, Somalia, Etria, you mean uh, Libya, Nigeria. We're working now in Eastern Europe with a number of nations where we're seeing remarkable breakthroughs, particularly Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Latvia, Moldova, Hungary, the list goes on. And these are people who suddenly see how to pray into something, not at something. Big difference there, Michael. Huge difference. So uh, speaking of wars, unfortunately with wars, there's always a lot of bloodshed. And we know from the story of Cain and Abel that the blood, the spilled blood cried out. Do you find that there are those specific things related to bloodshed on the land? You know, over the years, when we've walked with Miracle Channel, and, and this was something that we've been asked uh, for the last 20 years on Miracle Channel, there are four major areas of sin that defile the land. This is theologically, biblically accurate and astute. That's why we wrote the first book, Releasing Heaven on Earth, and the last one, God's Footprint on the Land, explains it. Untimely bloodshed, broken covenants, idolatry, and immorality are the composite ways of knowing why we bring offense to God. The result has always been what we see happening around us, war, famine, disease, ecological devastation. So the events that are taking place historically in the past and now yeah. are usually the cause and the effect of misappropriated or misunderstood stewardship on the part of who is the body of Christ. That's why we're in such a massive moment of change. Mm -hmm. And you can hear and watch the news and I do, I come up from a news background, as you do, 
but then it became pastoral. So I mixed the news with the pastoral to give people heads up issues on what really is going on behind the scenes. That's what we're doing. And that's why when you talk about bloodshed, you talk about wars, those are tangible ways of seeing the cause and the effect of spiritual issues for which there's an offense against God or we're simply not understanding from God's perspective what really is going on around us. Right. Uh, makes me think of that old song of holiness is our watchword and, and song. Uh, what kind of footprint on the land is being made currently, let's say in Eastern Europe? Well, if you take Eastern Europe, for example, I've just been doing a series on intercession with them and also a series on, interestingly enough, how to give thanks in volatile times. That's something that if you think about it, Western Christians don't really know what that means. We give thanks when things are comfortable, but actually the biblical imperative is giving thanks in all circumstances. So Ukraine, Latvia, Belarus, Russia, with whom I'm doing a lot of work right now, they're realizing it's not about giving thanks to God just for the sake of the problem. That makes no sense. It's giving thanks that God is in charge over the problem if we understand what he's calling us to do. Now they're seeing breakthroughs. I mean, we're seeing miracles with some of the people that we work with, their neighbors, uh, the enemy coming to a knowledge of the Lord, both in the Russian and the Ukrainian sides. Uh, we're seeing uh, templates where God is releasing supernatural intervention, protecting people. I mean, the human part of me is I'm working with hundreds. Sometimes they're being killed and I don't see them again. Their families are being devastated. Horrific things that, you know, we in the West don't really know what that's like. But it's part of the volatility that what's going on in the spirit realm tangibly is being seen in the physical realm. Are we seeing breakthroughs? Oh, yeah. I mean, I could give you a list right now of the nations that are having incredible breakthroughs numerically coming to Christ, imams coming to Christ, mosques coming to Christ. We're seeing that, Michael, in this day and age. But secular news does not know how to report that. Yeah, the, um, the carnal mind cannot understand the things of the spirit for sure. So we touched on the European conflict. Now the world's focus has shifted over to what we're seeing, that brutal Hamas terrorism against Israel and Israel's response, creating a lot of fear and, and bloodshed and death. What do you feel or sense that God is saying through these particular Middle Eastern events? Yeah. First of all, uh, a lot of people don't recognize the difference between Hamas and Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the terrorist group funded by Iran, and it's it's really horrific. It's absolutely horrific. Hamas is more in the Gaza area, but if you look at the Hezbollah, it comes from the Shia Islamic Brotherhood. If you look at the the issue of Hamas, it comes out of, of, of a different grouping of people. And so when you look at the difference between uh, these different Islamic brotherhoods, they both have a desire to eradicate Israel. They eradicate anything to do with the Jewish people and anything to do with Christianity, in fact. They don't say they do, but they do. So the horrific issues that are taking place right now whether it's to do with the original Sunni, the Hamas, or whether it's to do with the Shia Hezbollah, uh, the horror is that they have amassed weaponry funded in many cases by Iran and Russia, North Korea. You're seeing what I call quid pro quo packs coming out in the open. There's been some horrific preparations on their part. It's not that Israel was caught in a vulnerable place, but Israel has been surrounded by some pretty horrific moments. And it's not just a matter of winning a battle. It's about survival for who they are as a nation. Now, the reason I say that is this is part of what I call an end times picture. My work right now as a ministry, we have shifted. We're still in transformation and revival. But I have felt, and really our board has felt that, our intercessors have sensed that we're shifting now into what's called the preparation of the emerging remnant church. Now, look, there's always been a remnant church right from the day of Noah. He was the first remnant church. And I can explain that if you want in a moment. But we're seeing a remnant group in a place like Israel, where Israel is 
being taught and brought by the Lord into the forefront of global affairs. I've always said it this way, Israel is the global thermometer that explains the heat that's rising and the global barometer that expresses the pressure that's taking place globally. So is this apocalyptic? Yes, it is. Is this eschatological? Yes, it is. Is it end times? Yes, it is. Doesn't mean it's the last days of the end times, but it's how suddenly we're seeing, if you understand the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel 10, 11, and 12, and Revelation, we have historically, geographically, and certainly contextually today arrived at a moment of time, which we as a ministry, and I'm, I know Miracle Channel has been doing this for decades, explaining to people that a time would come when we would see forces come against Israel in the Middle East in a horrific way. That has now arrived. And you can see the Islamic anger. They want to see the 12th Imam appear. They believe Jesus is the deputy who will eradicate anything that's not Islamic. Absolutely misunderstanding of that. So it's like suddenly everything's come out in the open. And I've been speaking a lot over the decades about Haggai 2 and Hebrews 12, and that the shaking that in the Old and the New Testaments have said have come, will come in the end times is a shaking economically, ecologically, politically, sociologically, and spiritually, all these levels. And Hebrews 12 adds the only thing that will not be shaken is what's of the kingdom of God. So, Michael, I could ask a rhetoric question. Are we in that moment? I would say, as a researcher, categorically, yes. And we better be about the business of understanding what God is saying to us in such a time as this. So how should the church, let's say the Canadian church, be posturing or positioning itself right now as we're coming to the close of 23 going into 2024? Things are not the same as they were before. I talk a lot about posture. I had a bit of a, a physical accident, and so I've had to get a different office chair, get physiotherapy. If I go back to the old posture, oh boy, am I in pain. Posture and positioning is very clear in Scripture, always has been, that with a, a, a new season, and Ecclesiastes is clear in this, with a new season, we develop a different posture. It doesn't mean we throw out everything we've done. I'm not throwing out transformational revival. I'm importing that with a different accent of emphasis than I have before. So in other words, not only do we work with a higher level of humility and holiness, we've got to understand why God is exposing unholiness in the church, that we have idolatrized some of our favorite ways of doing things. And COVID was a humongous interruption for the church at large. I still believe in the church, but I don't like a lot of what I see the church involved with. It's really maintaining one's own platform, and I don't like doing that, but I'll talk about what we do for that reason. But at the same time, the focus is on the Lord. So in Canada, we have a massive shaking. We are shaking systems and structures politically, socially, religiously, we're seeing how God is developing a different wineskin. And if we don't somehow translate what we see happening around the world, particularly in the persecuted countries, like in one of our recent seminars, I've talked about coming, the coming spiritual beheading. And we had leaders, intercessors, business people at my seminar. They never heard of that, but right away they related to it. Because when I talked about AI, I talked about how I could be represented by other groups. That's a form of actually terrorism, beheading, persecution that we didn't know would be called persecution. Well, Dr. Petrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. That was Dr. Alistair Petrie. He is the Executive Director of Partnership Ministries and the author of God's Footprint on the Land. It has been over a year and a half since the Coots Four has seen the light of day. The four men accused of conspiring to commit murder of RCMP officers during the Coots border blockade in February of 2022 are still behind bars. None of them have been allowed to post bail. 
Now to chat about this in more detail is Marco Van Hugenbos, a Fort McLeod town councillor who is also a strong supporter of the Coots 4 and who he himself was charged with mischief over $5,000 during the Coots border blockade. Marco, welcome to Bridge City News. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, Marco, first of all, where does the situation stand now when it comes to your charges? Your trial is, what, coming up in April of next year? April the 2nd, I believe, uh, is, is the date that was scheduled in last, uh, last December. But um, looking at how some other um, legal, uh, legal cases have been going through the courts, um, I wouldn't be surprised if this date, this date gets pushed further back. Now, you, along with Alex Van Herk, also Fort McLeod, and Gerard Jansen of Tabor, all face charges of mischief over $5,000. If you're found guilty, you could face a maximum of 10 years in prison. How concerned are you with this? Well, the reality of the charges has, has, has come home. Um, it's, it's a serious charge. Uh, like you just mentioned, if convicted, the maximum penalty could be 10 years. I believe the... Crown is, uh, they, they proceeded with direct indictment, I believe, um, in, in discussions that, are, that have been had that they're, they're looking for three to four years. Uh, but again, the case, case is ahead of us, the trial is ahead of us. And um, of course, it would be concerning if I were to speak frankly and, and, and in relation to my family, um, if, if, I go to, if I go to jail, if I'm convicted and go to jail for for any length of time, that would have um, uh, that would be an extremely difficult situation for myself and my family. Uh, but um, I'll be honest; I, I, that's not something we're focused on at this point. Uh, we believe uh, I believe that um, we have a valid uh, opportunity, and and the, the 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 case and the trial ahead of us will uh, allow us to um, dispute the charges that have been thrown at us. And um, it's, it's sort of a stepped approach. At this point, we, we look to, to trial, and based on trial, we, we, will, we will reevaluate and uh, look at next steps. So, Marco, while all of this is going on, are you allowed to continue with your duties as a town councillor in Fort McLeod, or have you had to step aside? No, I, I'm allowed to continue. There was um, uh, complaints leveled against me. Um, but the MGA, the Municipal Government Act, does, did not have any authority or did not have any um, uh, bylaw or, or I was not in, uh, um, I did not contravene the MGA. Um, I did I have a letter of, um, uh, I was disciplined with a, a letter uh, from council in relation to the public role that I did participate in uh, during the Coots blockade. But um, as of uh, right now, I'm still a sitting second term councillor for the Town Fort McLeod. So can you explain to our viewers, Marco, exactly what you were fighting for during the Coots blockade? We were, fight we were fighting against government overreach. Uh, I've said this so many times, the COVID years, um, the early COVID years, uh, pre Coots blockade, we, we lost the ability to communicate with those who represent us. And to be quite frank, um, even those who represented us did not have the ability to do that. We were being governed by a PIC committee, by the EMCC Emergency Management Cabinet Committee. And we've now seen in the last month, um, or I believe it was five, six weeks ago, the Ingram decision um, ruled against the authority that the EMCC had. They that's not saying that things would have been different, but we protested and we stood up against a government provincially. Ottawa is a different story. Um, the Freedom Convoy addresses that. But provincially, we stood up against a government out of touch and, frankly, uh, out of control. Now, looking back at the Coots border blockade, Marco, would you have done anything differently? Um, there's a lot of things I would have done differently. This is not something that I've ever done before or have any intention to do again. Uh, so there was a lot of decisions that were made uh, in the moment, on the fly, with the limited amount of information or, or the information we had at that time. Um, in relation to the uh, uh, 
to two things that I would have done different. That would that's more of a specific question, but um, I, I could probably write a book about you know a, a bit of a manual on on um, on uh, how to properly uh, engage your government and 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 all that and what that all entails. So did you reach out to some of the government officials, like including the MLA, what they had to say? Uh, there, there was contact with um, not necessarily officials, but there was no contact with bureaucracy, but there was contact with MLAs and cabinet ministers. I, I was in contact with um, previous transportation minister, Rajan Sanye, uh, I believe twice, um, but there was never any contact on a official capacity. These would have been cabinet ministers, these would have been MLAs. Uh, we know Grant Hunter attended uh, the Coots blockade. Um, there were others, but there was no official um, delegation or direction given by the Alberta government, by the Jason Kenney government to communicate with those in the capacity to represent the Coots blockade. Now let's talk about the Coots Four here, Marco. Chris Carbert, Chris Lysak, Jerry Morin, Anthony Olianek. In your opinion, why is it that none of them have been granted bail? They've been behind, behind bars for a year and a half now. In relation to that, if I take the bail situation on its own, considering um, how lax the bail system and how dysfunctional the bail system is in Canada, like it, the statement that everybody gets bail in Canada is not is not uh, it's not untrue. Obviously, there's situations where a person wouldn't, but largely most people get bail. If we look at um, uh, minor uh, criminal or petty crime, or what the government or the crown deems as petty crime, sometimes the offenders make their way back to their community before the the enforcement that brings them in uh, makes their way back to a community. At least that's the case in southern Alberta. Um, I believe that these men not getting bail, that bail is denied um, once and twice for some of these men is a political decision. There's political influence and political interference to make an example and to, that I believe there's a, there's a, there's a bigger, there's a, I wouldn't call it a conspiracy, but there's a, there's a bigger picture at play here that ties back to the, Emergencies Act, the implementation of the Emergencies Act. Um, as you know, or if you don't know, I was subpoenaed to testify at the um, commission last November. And what struck me, and I actually had a, an interview in relation to the commission just recently. So I was think, thinking about those days and, and, and what all happened and the questioning and et cetera. What struck me, considering the emphasis, and this, some of this is, is retroactive based on the report that the commissioner um, uh, issued uh, last February or this February, based on the report that came out and how Coots was such a key catalyst to the implementation, like the guns and, 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 and all the details around Coots, how that was such a large catalyst to the implementation of the Emergencies Act. I found it very interesting how little focus Coots received at the at the commission. I was the only witness that was test, that, that testified on the protester um, side of things. I believe the uh, attorney general, deputy commissioner, commissioner, the mayor of Coots, and maybe uh, a few other officials spoke in relation to details. But as an attendee of Coots, I was the only individual subpoena. And if we look at Ottawa in comparison, there was 20 or 30 protesters that had a role or that had standing um, at the commission. So the focus was on Ottawa, rightfully so. Ottawa was a big deal as well, it, it, it's the capital city. But considering the rationale for the implementation of the Emergencies Act being Coots, it's interesting how little standing Coots received during the commission. So Marco, what do you say to the RCMP who say they have overwhelming evidence against the Coots Four, including 15 firearms that were confiscated, ammunition, and body armor? Uh, so I, at this point, it would be the Crown. I imagine the RCMP would have been involved in that investigation, but I would say to them, present your case. If you have a case, and if it's so cut and dried, what's with the, what's with the games? What's with the grandstanding? Why the delays? Why are we 
dragging this out to the point where these men will become eligible for a Jordan application. And 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 when I to explain on a Jordan application, uh, Jordan versus Canada, I believe there was a case back. I don't know the date, but it established the timelines to a fair and timely trial. And it, that that timeline is thirty months. Uh, we are over that halfway mark, and very soon we will approach that that deadline. And what I feel may happen due to what's happening for pre-trial motions. Uh, some of the things in play, and I can't speak to all of that. There's a publication ban, even though I'm not media. I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble for that. But what I see is happening is that the, the the crown's case is on is on shaky ground. That's my observation. I'm no legal expert. But that's my observation. I, I'm I, I have the ability to to d discern that. What I think will happen is they will become eligible for a Jordan application. The Jordan application. And this is just a scenario. Scenario: The Jordan application will will um, uh, go through the course, and these men will be granted their their charges will be dropped. There will be outcry, broken justice system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these men will never be truly vindicated. And the Crown, if if they had a case, won't try their case. And if they actually never had a case, also will never have to answer to the fact that there is a very real chance of Crown and RCMP corruption. Now, during police interviews, Anthony Olianek allegedly said that the federal government sought to destroy the middle class, install a communist regime before the start of executions and use of gas chambers. Those are some very serious accusations, Marco. I can't speak to Tony's comments uh, or the, 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 the setting these comments were made in. Um, I, I do know one thing. At that point in time, um, not ne not necessarily the coup blockade, there was a lot of anger at the government. And people want to talk about the coup blockade, um, all the other blockades, Emerson, K Kingsgate, Ambassador Bridge. They want to talk about the Freedom Convoy. And they want to talk about those days from the start till the end. But they nobody wants to talk about why were we there? Why did, did honest, hardworking Albertans and Canadians go to the, to the extent they did, to the point where they could possibly, uh, where there would be legal ramifications, such as my own charges. Why did law-abiding citizens have to go to that, that point? That, that's the real question that isn't being asked. And I feel that until we ask, until we as a country, as a society, ask that question, we're not going to be able to 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 heal or to move forward from COVID. Uh, it's like you know how trauma works, Hal. Right? Trauma gets pushed away, and but then trauma can resurface 20, 30 years from now. And I feel that the trauma of COVID. I'm not talking about what mandate was right, what wasn't. But there is real trauma. Look at the mental issues we're facing. Look at look at the the uh, opioid. Look at the drug problems we have in society right now. The homelessness. Look at the consequences, the financial consequences of COVID. That's not me pointing fingers at any one government official. But if we do not come forward as a country, as a society, and address these issues and have these frank tough, tough conversations, we can't move forward and heal. So Marco, we only have a few short moments left here, but I wanted to slip in two more questions for you. Number one, have you chatted with any of the men behind bars? How are they and their families holding up? I chatted with them. Um, I actually chatted with Chris Carver yesterday. I talked to him, uh, I, I talked to them both weekly and, and, and even more than weekly. Um, I go and see them. Uh, they're visited, they, you can see them, they get two visitations per week, one hour, each. Um, but this, you can just imagine how this has affected their families. Three of these men are dads. We have seven kids who haven't seen their, their dads for 18 months. Uh, I believe it's 18 months. We have families that have been torn apart. And I'm not here to, to speak to the details of their charges, to the details of their cases, what they said, all that. I, I'm not the judge. I'm not the jury. But where is the justice in this? Justice delayed is justice denied. And in relation to bail, these men had no priors. These men are not a threat to society. There, there's so many measures we could take to allow these men to be with their families. We, we, it's almost like, how do we expect these kids to integrate into society considering what they're going through? 
you know, kids need their, their, their dad, their dads and their families. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's been extremely stressful. Like it's, 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 I can't put it into words. Let's talk about the support the Coots 4 have received by many here in Southern Alberta and beyond. There was a convoy of around 235 vehicles in January of this year by those showing a lot of their support for the Coots 4. What other support have they received? They've received uh, tremendous support. There are, uh, um, uh, it took a while for the story to get out. Even for myself, it took, I assumed that the system would, you know, they would be eligible for bail and they would just work their way through the system like I am. And then that never happened. And that's where it got my attention. And it took a while before it became mainstream. There's a lot of ac large accusations against them. So the public was reluctant at first to get behind them. But what's happening to them right now is, is so unfair that most people, regardless of their views of it, know there's something wrong. And the support that has, been, that has come out of that is tremendous. There's individuals such as um, a Granny uh, McKay, who's a, an advocate for them. There is a Twitter um, show, Political Prisoners uh, under Jason Levine, um, or not Twitter, it's, it's, it's on Rumble. It's, it's a the Jason Levine show that, that in depth shares, shares their content. Um, the Coots 4 is no longer a rural, small, or a, a Southern Alberta rural, rural story. It's become a national and even international story. And, um, in that, with that, I believe that's a phenomenal, uh, um, that that's phenomenal success for those who have made that possible, but also for the four men, that's what we need. There has to be accountability and there has to be accountability brought back into our judicial system. Marco, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Hal. Thanks for having me on. That was Marco Van Hugenbos, Fort McLeod Town Councillor and one of the protesters from the Coots border blockade crossing during the pandemic of February of 2022 and a big supporter of the Coots 4. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.